Now our central focus, I am Director of Program and Community Studies, and our central focus has always been communities and problem solving in local communities. Um, there is a problem, however, about focusing on communities. And the problem is that if what you know about because of your studies is community, you don't know anything that everybody else doesn't know already. Right? Is there anybody here who isn't in a community? Is there anybody here who thinks you don't know about them? So here I am in this difficult position being at a university trying to come to people and talk to them about communities. And you know, I can't tell you a single thing you don't already know. There's a wonderful Sufi story that describes my dilemma. Do you know Sufi stories? I didn't until three or four years ago. Sufi are a Muslim sect or denomination, I suppose, I'd say. And they have stories, and the moral is at the beginning of the story rather than the end. And this particular Sufi story is based on a famous Sufi moral, which is, you will only learn what you already know. You will only learn what you already know. And the story goes like this. It takes place in the Middle East. I've always thought in a little town out in the desert. And the people in the town hear that in the next town there is a very wise person. And they want to learn from that person, so they invite her to come to their town. And when she comes, she stands in the middle of the square, and they're all gathered there, and she says, do you know what I'm going to tell you? And they all say, no. And she says, as you well know, you will only learn what you already know, and if you don't know what I'm going to tell you, you won't learn a thing. I can't waste my time here. Goodbye. And she left. <laughs> And they were stunned, and they went into a dialogue, and then finally they understood it. They invited her back, and she said, do you know now what I'm going to tell you? And they all said, yes, and she said, then obviously there's no reason for me to speak. <laughs> and she left. And they were just absolutely puzzled by her. And they talked and talked and talked in the community's forum. And then finally, they invited her back. And when she said, do you know what I'm going to tell you? They were all in the square. And the people on this side of the square, they all said, yes, just as the people on this side of the square said, no. So she had this chorus of yeses and noes. And she said, Will the people on this side of the square tell the people on that side of the square? And she never came back. <laughs> and that night, an old lady had a dream. And she came to the square in the next morning. And she said, ah, she is a wise woman. In a dream, I knew what she came to teach us. And that is that the ultimate wisdom is in communities and not in outsiders or experts or professionals or managers or technicians. And I think our studies of community problem solving have led us to that same conclusion. And that conclusion and its reasons are summed up in this book, which is called Building Communities from the Inside Out. And you've got the cover sheet and a couple pages from it in front of you. And I think you will receive in the materials after this a document that, that if you're interested in getting the book, you could order it. The reason I mention that is because what I'm going to try to do is to tell you what you already know in words, perhaps, that you haven't used about what you know. And the book is a guide to knowing what the principal ingredients of community are. Now, if you go to a sociology department, 
and you say to the sociology faculty member, members who study human groups, tell me what is the community. Here at the United Way, we're very concerned about the community, incidentally. Everybody's talking about community these days, aren't they? Tell me where it is. Tell me what it is. If you ask the faculty of a sociology department that question, you will never leave the sociology department. <laughs> they will talk and talk and talk because they don't have any effectively agreed definition. And so being in a university, we came to realize that community is in fact an idea in the head of each individual and every one of them is different. We've done experiments. We ask people, define your community. If I asked each of you to define your community, every single response would be different. So it's a little difficult <laughs> to try to think about community in general. However, having spent six years, beginning about eight years ago, in 20 North American cities, in over 300 neighborhoods, identifying initiatives that increased the economic, social problem solving, and political power of local people in local places, right? we think now we can tell you what the principal ingredients of effective community decision making are. And it, and therefore, we have to define what we mean by community. And I would like to share with you our definition because we think it is the most functional definition, although it is only one of the possible definitions. But for purposes of people such as yourself and ourself, who have community as a central idea of our focus, I want to suggest to you a definition about which you already know, but which is not very common or often lifted up. And the reason I want to do that is because when we were looking at the generative points for power growing in local places by local people, and I mean small scale places, neighborhoods, the great majority of the problem solving and power growing activities were generated by a particular part of local communities. And in fact, I want to suggest to you that we discovered the meaning of effective communities this way. Now, we think that the most important part of local communities, neighborhoods, places of small scale, places where people are face to face, is something that, that you know about and, and we tend to document, but that it was first described most effectively by a 23-year-old Frenchman in fact, I feel confident that the best description of local North American communities that has ever been written down was written in a book by a 23-year-old Frenchman in the year 1833 that you can't find a better description of unique North American communities than in this book. Now this young Frenchman was a count, or his father was a count. And his name was Alexis de Tocqueville. And he came to North America on a trip that his father had financed after he graduated from the University of Paris. And he came right along a line between Canada and the United States, stopping in communities, cities, towns, rural areas, and the frontier. He ended his trip at the edge of Lake Michigan, 
went, went south, came along the eastern seaboard, took a year for his trip, went back to France and wrote for Europeans a book describing what he saw here. And the principal thing he's reporting to these Europeans about our communities is that they are totally different than the European communities he knew. And what he knew were the communities of France, England, and Germany. And his book called Democracy in America is a report of what he found here. And at the center of his finding was this. He said, what makes local places distinctive in North America is how decisions are made. Local communities are completely different in North America than those in Europe around this question. In Europe, he said, decisions are made by elected officials, nobility, bureaucrats, professors, engineers, doctors, and lawyers. And yet, he says, every place in North America at the local level, those are not the people who make decisions. Who's making decisions in North America in local places? Is every, he doesn't quite say it this way, every Tom, Dick, and Mary. All these common people there think they should be making the decisions, not professionals, not elected officials. They should be making the decisions. And he said, let me tell you how they do it. They don't do it as individuals. They do it in little groups. And the groups aren't appointed and the groups aren't elected. They are self-appointed. And he said, what is unique about every local community, town, frontier, village, is that in fact when you go there, what is really going on there is that there are hundreds of these little self-appointed groups that are building the society, solving its problems, creating a culture, and vitalizing life. And he named these little groups for us. And maybe you can, I, I commissioned a, a, a very high-tech company to give a drawing of, uh, this is the John McKnight uh, reproduction system here. This is what he thought was the center of community in North America. Little groups of people who were self-appointed and who took three powers. Let me remind you what they are. First, the power to decide what is a problem. They didn't call any university to their community and say, could you tell us what are the problems here? They thought they were, as, as residents, the people who knew what the problems were. And secondly, he said, they took the power to decide how the problem should be solved. And this, he thought, was the absolute pinnacle of audaciousness that common people thought they knew how to solve problems. Because he knew in Europe, every common person knew it was an expert, a professional, who knew how to solve problems, right? That's what they were for. Not in, not in North America. He says folks thought in these little groups they could solve problems, figure out how to solve problems. And the third power they would take is they would go out and solve the problem using their own advice and getting their neighbors to join them. And he said, this is what a local community in North America is. It is these things doing those three things. It is the center of the power of that society that these people are the problem solvers and the doers of the makers of the creation of society. And he thought it was unbelievable. 
Now, this leads us to his name for these groups. Can you imagine coming and finding a society where the foundation stone and basic ingredient of the society at the local level is these little groups and there is no name for them? So he, in his book, made up a name, took a French word, and we anglicized the word, and he named these little groups for us. And the name he gave them was associations. Right? Now an association is not, however, from de Tocqueville's view, a group of people. It's not a bunch of individuals. But he was very clear who those are in that circle. They're citizens. So an association, there's a flock of birds, there's an association of citizens. And anybody who uses the word association for something that is not a gathering of citizens doing the work of society is misusing the word if you're going to take its principal author's definition. So a group that calls itself an association is basically a group of paid people or professionals is misusing the Tocqueville's term. And it was these little groups that we found to be in city after city and neighborhood after neighborhood the principal architects of the effect of problem solving and economic development that was going on in localities. Incidentally, the reason he called the book Democracy in America is because he said, in North America, democracy is much more powerful than it is in France and England. Because in France and England, we think democracy means you vote on your officials. And imagine, this is a 23-year-old writing this. He says, voting is a necessary but weak power because it is the power to give your power away. Right? And a minority can't even give their power away in an election, right? They lose. So he said, what is unique about the communities of North America is these groups. And what these groups are is the way democracy and problem solving have grown incredibly through local communities that are making power by taking power through associational life. And that's how he described our communities. And in 20 cities, over four years, in over 300 neighborhoods, looking for initiatives that solve problems and increase the economic potential and the political power of local neighborhoods, we were inevitably drawn to see again what de Tocqueville pointed to. So I'm telling you something you already know. Now, I want to remind you of something else that you already know. While you won't find a sociology department that can tell you what is the community with the clarity that the Tocqueville defined for us, there is a way of knowing what is not the community. Well, let me see. Can you show the next over here? So the Tocqueville thought a local community was basically something, and this is a wonderful drawing, like this. It was the space within a geography that encompassed a whole lot of associations that were connected to each other through their members, because people can belong to several of them, right? And that they were coherent, but different in their structure than other ways of doing things. Now, if this is the mark of community understood associationally, if this is the sign, 
there is also a sign that tells us you are not in the community. Did you know that? That's, and it's an international sign. You can find it in uh, Peking, Moscow, Paris, Ottawa. The international sign is posted all over to tell you you're not in the community. Could you show us the international sign? <laughs> Even sociologists would say that's not the community. However, one of the things that I think we can see when you focus on local community problem solving is that a lot of people think problems are solved in local communities by these things that are about the only thing that we can be sure isn't the community. And so, I want to remind you of the difference between a community understood associationally and this way of doing things, which is a system, right? Associations are a way people organize themselves to get things done. Systems are another way of organizing things to get things done. They are radically different ways of doing things, the community way and the system way. But each is a tool right, for achieving certain kinds of ends. If I gave you a hammer, right, you would understand it as a tool that is not designed to cut a board in half. And if I gave you a saw, you would say, it is a tool to do that. Well, I think what we know but we don't think about is associational communities are tools to do one set of things and systems are tools to do another set of things. And then I want to suggest to you that our increasing dilemmas in cities in particular and modern nations in general is our growing confusion about which tool to use to do what. Now, this tool is a wonderful tool to do some things. Tomorrow, I'm going to the airport and I'm going to get on an Air Canada airplane. Could you put the slide on before, the, the one you just showed? I don't want to get on an airplane run this way. <laughs> you understand? This is a tool, a way of getting things done. Wrong tool for flying airplanes. Would you put the other one back on? I want to be on an airplane run this way, by this tool. Right. But there are a lot of things where systems are absolutely wrong tools. And yet, some people are confused and they try to use them to do what only communities and association can do. So let me quickly try to review with you what we know but rarely think about carefully and that is what is the difference between these two tools, systems and communities, that are associationally defined. Could you put the next graphic up? Let's think about systems as a tool, like a hammer. And I want to remind you of some characteristics of systems that will help us understand what they're for. First, if you go to a graduate school of management at a university, they are not confused like sociologists are in graduate schools of management. 
because this is what they're about, right? This is what they're teaching people is how to use this tool. And if you will go, as we have done, to the faculty of a graduate school of management and say, what is the principal reason to organize people this way? They will say, in order to have a few people controlling a lot of people. Right? Have you ever seen one of these upside down? <laughs> that would be the way you'd organize You want a lot of people controlling a few. I have not hardly seen these upside down because they are mechanisms for controlling people and for having a few people with the mind and the design that is carried out by the hands and intellect of other people. Think of an automobile company, right? A few people think of what a Chevrolet Nova is going to be. And the whole purpose of this tool is to translate the ideas of a few through the hands of many so that every single one of them comes out to be exactly the same. Control is at the center of the purpose. So if control is what you want, you organize people this way. Now, why would you want to organize people? And again, I want to say, I'm not being pejorative, right? Am I? I never want to be on an airplane that isn't run this way. It's a life and death matter for me that I be on an airplane run this way. So never think we're being pejorative. We're trying to be descriptive and accurate so we can remember again what distinguishes systems from communities. So it is a system for a tool that controls people, but there's a reason for it in order to produce something, goods or services, right? And in the management school, they would say, well, it really isn't adequate to say that we organize this kind of a system to produce things because a shoemaker could produce a pair of shoes. This is a tool to produce a lot of the same thing, right? Which is why we organize it that way. It is about standards, similarity, lots of stuff, goods or services. So if we want one of these, to do something like individualize at the bottom, we're going to fail. And that's why so many social service delivery people burn out. Because they're in a structure designed to produce a lot of the same thing and they are told to produce different things every time. Why would you have a structure like this for people who are to produce something individualized and different every time? So it's the wrong tool. And we have lots and lots of trouble. People burn out being asked to use a tool that's inappropriate to the goal. Now the third characteristic of this kind of a structure is that it produces Another thing besides goods and services, it produces users, right? We would say users come to it, but advertising is trying to produce users. The more of these ways of doing things you have, the more users you need or the more people need to use the thing, right? And the name for the growing number of users of the growing number of same products, of the growing number of systems is clients in the service sector or consumers in the goods sector. So in our time, as this way of doing things has proliferated, clients have proliferated and clienthood has grown, right? When I think about when I was a kid, you know, I am so much more needy than I was when I was a kid because 
systems have figured out all kinds of things wrong with me that I didn't know was wrong. So I have grown in my clienthood, right? Somebody sent me last year an article from the Journal of Dermatology that says that something I thought was a condition is a disease. You can see it right here, right? Here I was walking around as a citizen with this condition and the systems are growing and all of a sudden I'm a client. Do you understand? So clienthood, consumer societies grow as systems grow, right? In number and scale. Uh, client is the right word. Client comes from a Greek word. And the Greek word from which it is derived means one who is controlled. Okay. Correct. A system for control has as its object one who is controlled. So this is what a system is for, I think. Now, let's compare this tool and what it does with the associational tool. It's like a saw. <laughs> it's not a hammer, it's a saw. It's a different tool. And nobody is controlled in an association. Those of us who work in systems, when we go out into communities and associations, we get frustrated because we can't control the suckers. They won't do what we want, incidentally. In the health field, one of the biggest things that social scientists are doing is compliance studies. Have you been to health care, you know compliance studies? That's how do we get those suckers out there in association to do what we're telling them to do here in our system. Right? But it doesn't work because communities are made up of groups that are there by consent, not by control. When I'm in a church basement with a neighborhood organization's task force on education on a rainy Tuesday night, as I was two weeks ago in a neighborhood in a city, everybody is there by consent. When I go to the university, everybody is there because the university pays us. And we do what they tell us to do. And in a church basement, nobody does what people tell you to do. So it's an uncontrolled world, this community. But it has powerful, powerful tools, associations. So there's a paradox, isn't there? Now the second contrast is what makes communities work is care. Why are these people in this church basement on a rainy Tuesday night when they could be watching the Blue Jays? Because they care about each other and about the community. Not because they're going to get grades if they come, or pay if they come, but because they care about community. So the power behind associations is care, not service. And communities and their associations are the domain of care. And here I think those of us in the social service world are, if I may say, the most confused of all people because and really would you think about this with me. Care is the heartfelt consent of one person to be responsible for another. And that is what you see in an association. The heartfelt consent of a group of people to care for and be responsible for each other and usually the society around them. 
systems cannot produce, organize, or manage care. And a tragedy of our time is we have become so confused about this simple truth that we keep acting like a system can produce care. Care is the heartfelt consent of one for another or one for some others. It cannot be mandated, it cannot be produced, it cannot be managed. I cannot say to these two people right here, I'm the boss, you care for him. You understand? No structure of control or authority has ever, ever produced care. And yet we're radically confused about that. In the United States, we are so confused that we have a laughable name called Medicare. Medicare is the national health insurance program. Medicare doesn't care can't care. It's a system designed to produce checks for doctors and hospitals. There may be some people in some hospitals sometime who care, but it's their choice. It's from the world of consent, and it's never produced. There are no care producers, no care managers. And the reason that's such a tragic error to associate care with systems is because then we misuse the tool. And let me try to see if there isn't an example that you can recognize. One of the hallmarks of the last generation, last 30 to 40 years, is an ever-growing use of systems to be responsible for people under the age of 18. Right? So that most people under the age of 18 in cities in a modern society are surrounded day in and day out by systems. And in most, North, uh, most modernized countries, first in cities and then in rural areas, over the same period that we have had ever-growing systems to provide services to people under 18, youth programs, health programs, recreation programs, schools, preschools, after schools, more schools, our children have acted funnier and funnier and we are more and more concerned about them. And I can't find in any neighborhood any people who believe that more system services for young people will stop them from being so strange to us. Because they know as citizens that what has happened is they have been removed from the community of care and sent over to the exile of the land of service systems. And they feel uncared for and they act ways we don't like. And that the youth problem is not a youth problem. It is merely the result of a misuse of one tool and an underuse of the other. And that's why we're spending our morning trying to make sure we know the difference. It is this space that will recover young people to society. And there is no evidence anywhere that an ever-increasing youth clienthood 
by an ever more helping set of systems is turning youth away from the terrible result that occurs when they become clients surrounded by systems and segregated, therefore, from the main line of society. In fact, it is, we think, the fact that most of our modern social problems that are not economic are the result of using systems where only associations will work. of using professionals where only communities can do the work. And that the problem of our time is not that we don't have effective enough systems, but we have too many doing too much and pushing aside the central power-making, decision-making, and caregiving center of society. And the third difference is, of course, what de Tocqueville saw. If you have more and more associations, you have more and more citizenship. If you have more and more systems, you have more and more clienthood. A totally served community is a genuinely weak place. If the associations have been pushed out because a client is one who is controlled. And a citizen is the reverse. It's the most powerful person we know in our, our form of society. You can't empower or develop communities by increasing clienthood at the expense of citizenship and production. And that's the dilemma of our time, is that we underuse this tool and we overuse the other. And number two, and unfortunately, and I think it's taken us a long time talking with social historians to understand this, system tools have tended to push out community tools. So that the more outreach and the more community presence systems have, the less work associations and citizens do. And that it probably is not the case that we can have more of both, but that one pushes out the other. Now there is one other difference between these two ways of doing things. A, a steel mill has a system, and you have raw material. You, you can have all the steel mills you want. Without the raw material, it will be nothing, right? And so you need coal, Iron ore, lime. Service systems need raw material. The name of the raw material they use is called needs. Do you know this glass? It's half full and it's half empty. It's like me. Right? It's like you. We have deficiencies and problems and emptiness, and we have fullness and gifts and capacities. Right? This is true. You know, the question, is the glass half full or is it half empty? And the answer is yes, it is. And yes, we are. But these things need as raw material the emptiness of people. But associations are the form of organization to take the fullness of people. So if you have lots of systems of service you need lots of deficiency problems, right? But associations don't need needs at all. Communities have no need for needs. In my hometown, little town in Wisconsin, we have one carpenter, and he has one leg. 
Nobody in my hometown needs John's missing leg. We need his other leg. We need to understand him not as physically disabled, but as a carpenter, because he's the only one we got. And if we begin to think of him as physically disabled, our community will stop growing. But in Madison, the big city, 45 miles away, they have a service system called the Rehabilitation Institute of the School of Medicine of the University of Wisconsin. It's like this. It needs John's missing leg. <laughs> right? Just like you need iron ore, it needs missing legs. If it doesn't have missing legs, it will make no difference that it exists. Right? So remember that if you are supporting systems, what they will do is come into my hometown with an outreach program and start looking for people's missing legs, right? And they'll say they're finding, doing need surveys and meeting needs. Meanwhile, in my hometown, for community building purposes, we are systematically ignoring his missing leg in order to take advantage of his full half. And that is the central difference between these two tools. One focuses on deficiency, the other focuses on capacity. And if your resources and funding and allocation programs only reach systems that meet needs, you will, by an unintended side effect, produce an ever-growing emphasis in the communities on what is wrong and missing rather than what is there and productive. And what we now know is that what happens in some communities is that if enough system needs meters surround the community, people's mind about themselves begins to change and what happens is the idea of clients being fixed, of us being needy, of the solutions being outside grows and grows and grows until you have a client neighborhood of powerless, impotent people and the neighborhood declines. We have found in no city a well-served community that is advancing in power or physical or economic rehabilitation. This is not a tool that does this. This is a tool that will fix individuals. Giving it all its resources it wants will make it grow, but it will never empower citizens and it will not lead to community development because the tool for community development is citizens and their associations being productive. I am at a university. And unfortunately, we are an institution that has misled many communities because we have a vested interest in describing neighborhood emptiness. Where I am, we have a bunch of social scientists who feed their children by going into neighborhoods and finding missing legs, counting up deficiencies. They call them needs surveys. And when they are done with their work, they have a map of community. Can you show us that community map? And this is the all too typical social science portrait of a community. It is absolutely, without doubt, objectively one half the truth, right? But it is the truth that will feed the growth of systems and will have no benefit for citizens and associations to take power and make power. Because it's a 
prospector's map of the raw material for service systems. Just like there are prospector's maps drawn by people who are out looking for iron ore for your factory. University professors are the prospectors for emptiness, problems, and deficiencies that are needed by systems that meet needs. Now, there is another map. And it is the other half, a map of community assets. And an example of a community asset is on the next page. I don't have a, a chart of it. If you allocate your money based upon needs surveys, you will be making the decision that is your intention to have systems grow and clienthood increase. If you decide to allocate some of your resources to associations of citizens, you will be investing in community development and empowerment. And all over North America, what is emerging, I think, is an increasing clarity about the difference of these two tools and the consequence of supporting only one of them. Now, if I may, in conclusion, I would like to suggest to you the kind of guidelines that a foundation, government, or United Way might adopt if they wanted to make sure that they were investing in community empowering associations as well as client serving systems. But basically, they're not numbered. It makes six suggestions of, of the guidelines that would be adopted if you wanted to open the channel of allocation to communities and their associations in addition to the wide channel that you have now for service systems. First, and it's written as though it were the guidelines talking to people who wanted your, your, your money, right? So you would say, in essence, first, we would like you to tell us about if, you want, if you're going to do something in the community, the first thing we want to know is identify the skills, abilities, and capacities and assets from the neighborhood. Right? We do not want to know anything about the needs in the neighborhood. We want to know what skills are there, what capacities there are, what assets there are. And we want to know how those people with those skills and capacities and those neighborhood assets are going to be used in this proposal. Because we're investing in community building, not system building, with these guidelines. So we want to know who are the community folks, not who are the professionals who know what's wrong and are going to fix this, but who are the community po folks who know how to solve problems and have skills that are unused that are going to be mobilized to build the community. That's how all communities were built. Second thing we want to know is how are the associations of the community being mobilized in this activity? Not to support systems, but to do the work. Can you show us that 20 associations have come together and are going to start to recover responsibility for young people? Because we're not investing in youth services anymore. We've gone as far as that'll go. So tell us how the associations of community are going to be mobilized to achieve the goal in the community's well-being you're, you're, you're saying you want to work on. 
The third one is, we want to know how this proposal will take the capacities and gifts of citizens and the associations and when we're done, leave them stronger than they were with more skill, more commitment than when we began. We don't want them to be joined together with systems where they become more dependent. We want to make them more autonomous and more responsible. The fourth one is, how will our money support the local economy while doing the things that we're talking about? Who is the end recipient of the money? Is the money going to a professional who comes to the neighborhood during the day, gets the money, and takes the money out to where the professional lives? Or is the money going to citizens or enterprises in the local community where it will begin to cycle through a neighborhood economy? Who's the end recipient of our money? And is it the community locally? And the fifth one is something that we learned over and over again in city after city from really effective local community development groups. And it is this. To a foundation, or a United Way, or a government agency, we commend your saying, we are always a second investor. Don't come to us from your neighborhood with a proposal about doing something that you think really needs to be done, because we only want to invest in something that really needs to be done. And if you, from your neighborhood, come to us and say, here's a proposal, and as soon as you give us some money, we'll start doing what needs to be done in our neighborhood, it doesn't need to be done enough, and we won't give you any money for that. You start. If it needs to be done, and the principal doer that we're investing in is local people, you start. Then you come to us, and we're second investors. Incidentally, all the evaluative research on foreign aid indicates that that principle is a must. We have wasted more Western money by being first investors, by defining what the problem is and then giving people money to bribe them into doing something we think is important, rather than their defining what needs to be done, starting to do it, and then our supporting them in the doing of it. So it's a, a universal principle, I think, for community building from the outside in, which is what funders do. And finally, the last is buried in the first. <laughs> if you go back to the first one, the, the second part of the first one reads, and let me read it and then say one or two words about it. We are particularly interested in how you will discover and use the gifts and the abilities of the strangers in your community. And by strangers, we mean, and let me say, this is a way of talking about somebody in your midst whose gifts you do not know about. That's a stranger in your midst. Why? Because every single person has a gift, has many gifts. If you have people in your community that you don't think have gifts, they are strangers, and you're wrong. But we have an international blinding system, right? An international system for blinding us to the gifts of people. And it is called labeling. And the way you blind people to the gifts of their neighbors is to call them 
mentally retarded, welfare mom, physically disabled, pregnant teenager, ex-convict, or aged person. And you can complete the list. Those words have had the function in modern societies of blinding us to the gifts of people. And the trouble with that blindedness in so many communities is that it leads us to exile from the center of community gifted people and put them in services. That's the exile from community. It's the community disempowering process to take people and say what is important about you is your deficiency and we got a name for it. We're going to say we're going to help you by isolating you from community. Every time that happens, the community grows weaker. And every real community empowerment activity we have ever seen that is really reaching deep is about recovering people who have been isolated in the human services by insisting they have gifts and pulling them back into the community around their gifts. That's what a powerful community is. It's a place that has a culture that says everyone has a gift and we're organized to see that it's given. So the last and I believe most important point is what this chapter is saying. I mean, the, the, this, the latter part of this first paragraph is saying, which is, if we're going to invest in any activity in the community, not only do we want to see that our money is spent there as well as the activity takes place and citizens are involved, but we insist that people who have been made strangers by these dirty names must be involved in this project. So if you want us to support a housing rehabilitation program, we want to know how a developmentally disabled and teenage pregnant girl are going to be involved in building that project. Everything we support is designed to recognize, promote, and develop the power and the capacity of everybody in the neighborhood. We have supported their isolation and the emphasis on their needs and deficiencies, we are going to correct that. We made a mistake. And so every productive community building associational activity we support must have labeled people in it being productive, delabeling them, doing away with the stranger. Let me conclude with a Canadian story. Six years ago, in Prince George, in northern British Columbia, a city of 90,000, a place I had never been, I can assure you, <laughs> I had an opportunity to visit. And I found there a little association of seven very prominent citizens. who had dedicated themselves to the idea that the biggest problem in Prince George was that so many people had been labeled and sent to the edge of their community in the name of service and the needs focus. And that they, as powerful citizens at the center of the society, should organize to say this is a hospitable community and it needs capacities, doesn't need needs. And so what we are going to do is to create a group to pull people who have been thought to be untalented into the community. And they named themselves initially the Joshua Committee, knocking down the service walls so that people who had been thought to be empty 
could be discovered again in terms of their capacities and would no longer be strangers in their midst, as they call them. And let me report to you the first time that this took place. The first person in this group is the most, is the most prominent television and radio figure in Prince George, a fellow named Bob Harkins. He has an interview show each day on television and does the commentary on the news and the radio. And so he went to a place of exile, a group home that had been supported by all kinds of funders. And he decided that's the first place we could really find strangers in our midst. We're weak because those people are there. Their gifts are not given. And he went there, and the first person he met was a, a man named Edward Heim. And Edward, I think, is about 45 years of age. He's a man in a wheelchair. He is, I don't know, I'd call him crunkled. He sort of looks like this. Right? And he's never spoken. And Bob came each day to get to know him. And it was a little difficult because Edward didn't speak. But Bob noticed one day that on the television there was a rock band. And when the rock band came on, because Edward's chair was facing the television, Edward winced and grimaced, went, And all of a sudden, Bob said, ah, now I can see he has a reaction to music, and he hates rock music as much as I do. <laughs> we have something in common. And then he talked to a person who worked there and mentioned this. Edward really hates rock music, doesn't he? And the person who worked there said, yes, but that's because he loves classical music. He says, how do you know? She says, well, let me put a classical record on. <laughs> and Edward lit up when the classical record was put on. So Bob thought, in Prince George, there is a symphony orchestra, a major symphony orchestra. They even have a full-time paid director, John Unsworth, a monthly concert. And Bob goes with Barbara, his wife, every month, has a good seat in the fourth row on the aisle. So he decided to take Edward. And Edward sat in the aisle right next to Bob and Barbara. And it's important, isn't it, that the best known figure in the community has as a friend Edward Heim there. This is community building. What made that community weak was Edward Heim was over in the service. So he was there. And he had never been at a symphony, and when he heard that music, he came to life. And in the middle of the, of the concert, there was a, a piece, a symphony that came to a great crescendo, you know how it is, and then there's a silence, and then it goes on softly. So this great crescendo came, and when it stopped, throughout the audience, everybody could hear, Oh, boy! <laughs> and those were the first known words that Edward Heim had said in 45 years of life. Oh, boy. Well, this impressed, of course, the conductor, John Hunsworth, <laughs> <laughs> who was a friend. Uh, Bob Harkins at Barbara Harkins. So afterwards, he came down to meet this person with such enthusiasm for his music. And Bob told him about Edward's love of classical music, and John said, well, you know, we practice every week, and if he likes classical music that much, he said, Edward, why don't you come to our rehearsals? So Edward started going to the rehearsals every week, 
and sat now up on the stage looking at the orchestra in the symphony. And what began to happen was an amazing thing. The people in the symphony for the first time had in front of them a person who loved them and what they were doing so much that they could see it. Because normally they can't see the audience and it's hidden by the lights. And his influence on them grew and grew and John Unsworth could begin to see that if there was a night when Edward Heim wasn't there, the musicians clearly did not play as well. And so two years ago, I think it was, was the 150th anniversary of Mozart's death. And every symphony in the Western world had as its premier concert the Mozart concert. And so that year, John Unsworth's program for the year had the big box with the big symphony. It was the Edward Heim Mozart Memorial Concert. In the night of the concert, Edward was in his first tuxedo, in his chair. And he had, at the rehearsals, been given a baton. And he had begun, he had a very difficult time, but he had begun moving the baton. And he had become more and more expressive. And so, when one of the great symphonies of Mozart was to be played that night, Edward Heim's chair was turned to the symphony. And he directed Mozart's symphony in an amazing, amazing way. And everybody, 900 key people in that community, were showered with his gifts. They no longer saw his need. They were pulled together in community in a way that they had never been before. And from that moment, Prince George began to become a culture moving away from need and charity to citizenship and community and gifts. And I went there for two years once a month to do a continuing evaluation of this group of seven people citizens in association. And when I went there the last time, three years ago, they said to me, we are making you a pledge this day. Outside of town there is a sign that says Prince George, 90,000 population. And when you come back in the year 2003, 10 years from now. There will be a sign there that says, Prince George, there are no strangers here. A community so powerful, so unneedy, so citizened, so contributory so powerful. I know that the only real way, the united way, can make a difference in the future is by following in Edward's way. So thank you very much. <laughs>